great, everyone. Thanks so much for uh, for for uh, taking some time today. Uh, I'm really excited to to talk with some of my friends here about supply chain and pharmaceuticals. We've heard so many really cool things about uh, the progress being made in, in in blockchain, about visions for the future, about uh, these really neat applications, and. What I was hoping we could do in this short 25 minutes or so that we have to talk here is focus a little bit on the here and now. What are we actually seeing um, occurring out in, uh, in, in the life sciences space, uh, particularly around some of the supply chain, uh, blockchain applications, and you know, maybe how some of these things changed even just recently. So um, maybe we can just do a quick round of introductions. Rodrigo, we'll start with you. and um, you know, what are you seeing in blockchain um, for Merck? Hi, thank you, Jamie. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. Uh, the last time I was uh, into a blockchain event, I was the only one wearing a suit. So, <laughs> so now I am not wearing a suit, as you can see. I am in my, in my house. Uh, thanks for inviting me. I am uh, in charge of uh, Global Key Accounts at Merck Animal Health. As you guys know, we have a pilot right now uh, going on with one of our customers for uh, one of our products. What we see right now in blockchain is the importance of having an understanding of what's the short-term business case. Obviously, this is a very long-term initiative for us, a long-term commitment. But we do think that it's very important to also show to our organization that we have a short-term business objective. Um, the other thing that we see going on is um, how much we could help, help some of our customers to uh, become better at the control of their inventories and their product distribution through tools like blockchain and platforms like, like, like blockchain. And then the last thing that we, that we see is the need for uh, public platforms, right? We see a lot of uh, uh, private initiatives that cost money and it's hard to decide where do you invest the money if you invest it into piloting and doing things for your customers or joining different, uh, different uh, consortiums. Oh, that's great. Thank you. Uh, thank you for sharing that. And and actually, Megan, maybe just building right off of uh, what Rodrigo had talked about, uh, can you talk about some of your involvement in, uh, in, in Merck's broader blockchain initiatives? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I apologize for the lighting around me. My office isn't the best for this, but it's the only place I have at the moment. Um, but so at, at Merck, there's a, so Rodrigo talked about the animal health side, but I'm more focused on the human health side. Um, I'm in our supply chain IT organization, and one of the initiatives that I'm currently supporting is something called Connected Channels. And Connected Channels is part of a broader initiative within um, Merck's organization called Plant to Patient. And that initiative aims to connect the plant to the patient um, by streamlining and making our supply chain more secure. So um, Connected Channels, like I said, is an initiative under there, but it, it mainly helps to connect the plant to patient using blockchain solutions. Um, we currently have a, a bunch of different POCs going on at the moment within connected channels, um, both in Merck specifically, and then also in consortiums um, within the pharmaceutical industry. So I'll, I'll probably touch upon the, the consortiums a little bit later, um, but just to make things a, a little shorter, because I know we're short on time, but uh, some of the POCs that we have going on currently within Merck um, is exploring how to store e-leaflets on blockchain. So um, the product inserts that you see, if you've ever gotten a, a prescription, um, usually the e-leaflets are very, very big. So we're looking to digitize those and also store them on the blockchain. Um, we're looking at things like digital fingerprinting, so creating an unclonable fingerprint for our packaged products. Um, and of course, we have a, a few track and trace solutions going on at the moment as well. Um, so that's, like I said, that's very, very short. We also have a, a lot of um, use cases that we're thinking about exploring in the future as well. And uh, I'm really excited to be here and to, to talk about it. So thank you. Ooh, thank you. And uh, Susanna, there's been so much exciting stuff coming out of uh, Chronicle, but more specifically Medi Ledger this year. Um, 
<laughs> maybe you could do your best to give us kind of like the, 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 the recap and some of the exciting progress you guys have made. Yeah, thank you, James. I'm Suzanne. I'm CEO at Chronicled, and I um, am very excited. We launched uh, the Metal Ledger Network. Um, our first solution is for product verification. It's to help with compliance of the Drug Supply Chain Security Act, and maybe to frame it well, which I think is part of the excitement of this uh, conference, it's in production. Uh, the nodes have been set up. It's truly decentralized, and it's enabling from a scan of a barcode on a box of medicine to be able to hit the manufacturer's database, any licensed manufacturer in the US, and get an answer back that the data is authentic. We actually think in these COVID times, it could prove a useful tool um, if there is risk of counterfeit uh, drugs entering the US supply chain, literally a barcode scan now within less than a second can uh, return an answer. We're also working um, on a revenue management solution. Uh, it will be available next month uh, companies are setting up infrastructure um, and the production network will be stood up by this summer. So um, it's a super exciting time, I think, to echo sort of what Paul said earlier. Um, it's actually happening now, um, maybe often quietly while others aren't paying attention. Um, but the, the use of blockchain to help improve business and deliver real ROI um, is real and it's now. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely has been so much um, and, and in lots of different spaces. I mean, even across those few use cases that we just talked about here, we've covered the spectrum from uh, traceability to, to fingerprinting to uh, unique IDs. In fact, actually, Megan, you had mentioned something about some of the consortiums. And I, and I know this is a space that um, that, that, that Merck has been uh, pretty heavily involved in. And, and Suzanne, I know uh, Chronicle also plays in that role. Maybe we could talk a bit about um, how consortiums are helping to shape what we're seeing in pharmaceuticals around some of the standards and, and, and use cases. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so just like Suzanne said, Merck was also part of um, a pilot, a consortium uh, that aimed to satisfy the DSCSA requirements in supply chain. Um, we partnered with Walmart as um, kind of simulating the, distrib or the dispenser and Merck was kind of simulating the manufacturer. So um, we did that at the, at the end of last year and we're currently working on um, figuring out how we can move that forward. Um, but that's a, that's a little bit of a smaller consortium. When we start to talk about bigger consortiums that are actually in production at the moment, um, we have a couple. So one is called the TRAP Network. TRAP Network, it's T-R-A-P, um, kind of a funny name. I, I don't know off the top of my head what it stands for, but it's a, it's a consortium that um, currently aims to uh, to satisfy the use case of track and trace. Um, so we have it in production in our Hong Kong market currently. Um, and then we're looking to expand that into other markets. So think uh, markets like China and also Ukraine. Um, but we're currently collaborating on that consortium with um, SAP and Zuig and Bayer. And then the, the last consortium that I wanted to talk about and the biggest that Merck is currently participating in is something called Pharma Ledger. And Pharma Ledger is a European based consortium. Um, it consists of, I think like 13 different pharma companies and um, 21 companies in total. If you wanna see the entire list of the companies participating, you can go to pharmaledger.com. Um, <laughs> it has a full list of companies. So, but basically that consortium just kicked off at the beginning of the year and um, we're looking to build a use case in three different areas. So the first area is in supply chain. Uh, the second area is in health data. And then the third area is in clinical trial recruit, uh, clinical trials. But uh, within that consortium, there is, I think, like seven different work packages. Um, the first work package aims to identify the use cases. Um, the second work package aims to actually build out the applications. And then the third work package, which is what I'm part of, aims to identify the architecture requirements um, and really lay out the architecture handbook is what we're calling it. Um, I won't go over the other work packages because <laughs> <laughs> we don't have time for that. But um, within the work package three, we're, we're really aiming to um, identify those standards that will be used when we build out the use cases. So uh, a few kind of key things we're exploring at the moment are um, something called DIDs, which is a decentralized identity, um, which can be used for individuals that are interacting with the blockchain. Um, if you think about things like uh, vac vaccination passports um, and other things where someone needs to be identified and to be verified individually. 
Um, DID is, is a really cool technology that I think is being explored a lot over in Europe um, at the moment, and we're also exploring it in our consortium as well. Um, another kind of standard that we're looking at is EPCIS um, mm -hmm. to, to enable EPCIS messages to interact with our blockchain. Um, and we're currently working to build out EPCIS enabled APIs um, that allow those messages to be inserted not only into one blockchain, but any blockchain that is of interest. So we like to call That's them really kind of plug and play solutions. Yep. Yeah. Yep. No, that's really neat. And I think, you know, the roles that standard orgs like GS1 who, who, who um, set up EPCIS are, are, are huge in this. And um, Suzanne, I know actually, even in the design phases of Mediledger, you were working with some of those same standards bodies. Is that correct? Absolutely. Um, GS1 has been an active participant in the Mediledger work. Um, now that we're looking at revenue management, um, we've also brought HIBIC, um, which is the standards body for um, healthcare identification numbers. Mm -hmm. Um, I think the need to have consortia be inclusive, really listen to how the industry does business is really vital to make sure these solutions can be easily adopted. Um, so I, I think similar to Megan and all the great use cases at Merck, um, the, import, the importance to me of consortia is that you really need the companies to come together to really define almost the business requirements of the process between each other yep. um, to really make sure it's a win for everybody. Yeah, and I think that's some of the key stuff, and it even reflects back on a lot of uh, Paul's opening comments around the consortia helping to, and, and individual companies helping to drive the business process, and then the platforms um, eventually moving into these public standards-based uh, open systems that where we can all participate. Um, I think there's just some amazing work that's, that's kind of going on there. Um, Rodrigo, I did have a quick uh, kind of question for you or, or wanted some comments because I know your focus has been so much on um, Merck Animal Health customers. And uh, I know part of the, one of the projects that we had worked on was around bringing uh, visibility to them. So I'd like to know from your perspective, like, is designing a blockchain just for, for, for Merck the right approach or what do you think you have to do from a customer perspective? Yeah, I think, thank you, Jamie. I think um, uh, we started this uh, journey in animal health um, through, and, and excuse my, my ignorance in the technical side, but I'm, more, I'm much more of a business uh, commercial operations person, but- um, You're far more technical than you give yourself credit. <laughs> yeah, we, we got ourselves into this precisely because we wanted to give more transparency to our customers in terms of what products they were getting. You know, uh, a lot of you may know that producing a vaccine is not very easy. And um, sometimes uh, you have different amounts of supply and handling that with transparency was a must for us and it was a must for our, from our customers. Now we were explained by the experts like, uh, oh, like you and Megan that you know, we, we didn't need blockchain for that. Um, they, what we, that was while that was our primary objective, the thing that we are achieving through blockchain is that we are easily integrating the systems from our customers to our systems versus having to invest millions of dollars to get their ERP system to talk to our ERP system. Yeah. And that's really the big win for us, right? That's when we where we see a lot of advantage and where we start seeing a short term. We know it's short term. Uh, business benefit for us that allows us to keep investing in, in uh, implementing this this platform in our in our businesses. That's right. Yeah, I mean, when you think about the the amount of effort it takes from an IT perspective to maintain all those individual interfaces with all those different systems, I think there's such a huge lift um, for developing these types of uh, of platforms there. Um, and actually, uh, this is a maybe bouncing back to you, right? Because I think MediLedger is a great example of one place to integrate. And um, I know you guys have currently set up, um, it's, a, it's a private Ethereum network that kind of runs on the back end of the verifications process. But um, when you look out into the future, uh, do you see that always being in a private network? Or do you think that some of this will start to, uh, to become more open? Uh, it's a great question, James. I, I actually maybe echo what Paul said earlier. Um, we've been doing this work since 2017, and we wanted to deliver business value to these companies, and there wasn't any public forum that really could meet, I would say, both the security and capacity requirements of what we saw for the industry, but it certainly doesn't preclude that the future could eventually um, connect 
to public blockchains or, or move over. Um, but I would say uh, wanting a use case that gets enterprises to adopt the solution, do the learnings, understand how they will play a role in networks, um, we felt was really critical. And it's important to provide that business value now and not wait for a future time when um, maybe all of the rest of the infrastructure is available. So we're proceeding. Um, and um, I think there's a lot of uh, learnings that are already coming out of the work that we're doing at the same time as delivering business value. Really cool. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. Um, there's uh, um, checking some of the Q&A coming in now. We're getting a list of pretty good, uh, uh, pretty good questions that are coming through here. So um, actually, I want to start with the first one. Actually, this is pretty good. Uh, <laughs> considering that the world is a different place um, than it was about a month ago due to, due to COVID-19, do you think, um, and this is really just open for, for any of you, do you think that COVID is accelerating the drive for consortia and, and, and blockchains and transparency in the supply chain? Um, or do you think the use cases are, are remaining relatively unchanged? I, I think, uh, Jamie, this is Rodrigo, I think it is accelerating the need for transparency. That for sure. And, uh, you know, you know my opinion and my position on, course, on consortiums. I think they are good and they are helping us, but I think they have a shelf life. And, uh, and, and, and I think this is pushing, uh, the current situation is pushing more for, for public, uh, public solutions where everybody can get into and start providing uh, transparency. I think that's the biggest objective, right? Transparency is not just track and trace yeah. uh, and is definitely accelerating. And we see it in our animal health business, right? For the food production, we play a key role on making sure that uh, food production keeps going and transparency has become key. Mm -hmm. And right now in this situation, for me to share information about production of a plant in Netherlands and distribution through a freight forwarder and then distribution uh, through DHL in one of the countries is, is a pain. Mm -hmm. And a solution like this will help it a lot. Um, you know, I think consortiums play their role for sure, but I think they have a, a shelf life and I think that shelf life is maybe shortened with the with the situation that we're living in and, and to your point rodrigo i mean we're, we're seeing regulations coming out now with uh at least in the u.s with the cares act around requirements for stockpiles um and and to prove that you have inventory on hand for certain things um it really is kind of fascinating uh megan or, or, or Suzanne, any any kind of reactions on that piece of it there's also a whole other list of questions we can move to yeah, I'd like to chime in here quick. Um, just going off of Rodrigo's statement, I think it definitely would be very beneficial if we already had a, a, a public or a, a blockchain that we can trust and share the data kind of um, more in a more streamlined fashion. But building on top of that, when you think about the use cases that could um, benefit the COVID-19 issue, um, if we start to figure out that the antibodies, you know, help you have a, um, not being able to catch the the virus later on then we can think about developing something like a, a vaccination passport or very similar to that not vaccination but antibody passport so if you on the blockchain you can say that i've already had this uh, disease and i have the antibodies and you can have it in a trusted way um, where we can kind of verify it then i think that's something that we can uh, maybe learn and take for the future and, and start trying to develop now so when something like this happens Later on, cool concept. ready yeah. for it, yeah. yeah. Um, all right, so we have one of, we have another question here. Uh, I think this was interesting, and, and Susanna, I'd love to get your take on this. Uh, what future problems or bottlenecks might arise from implementing blockchain technology in supply chain management? All right, so I guess we are looking into our crystal balls now, right? But what do we, you know, you have a pretty clear vision of, of how these systems are going to play a role. What do you think might actually be some of the things that impede business in the future using blockchains? So I actually want to piggyback on, I think, some of the comments that Rodrigo made um, uh, that I can appreciate the interest and desire for transparency, but I also know that's actually a blocker. There are companies who own or manage data and don't necessarily want to provide full transparency through the supply chain. Yeah. So I will say our um, operating belief is the way to implement this technology is actually to solve business for all the parties involved and see where it'll evolve from there. 
our premise is what blockchain enables, if I can illustrate a little, is it actually lets you put a um, embassy behind your trading partner's firewall to make sure that your business rules are enforced. So our premise is when that drug, let's say, arrives at a uh, final customer or dispenser, they may not have the transparency to have seen everywhere that it was, but they will understand all the business rules that were enforced along the way. And that business rule enforcement provides uh, validity that the drug was handled correctly at all times. Certainly, if there's interest in inventory visibility to manage, we can pass information back to ERC, or ERP systems to let manufacturers do better planning. But I think this premise of, let's say, full transparency, I think a lot of businesses feel threatened by that. And if you don't have everyone participating, um, you are going to end up having things that block adoption of the technology. So we're at least coming from the position, how do we make sure it follows the rules and it's a win for everybody? And then we expect in the future, I would say a lot of the exciting additional uh, uh, use cases that maybe aren't going to be available at the very beginning will open up. Yeah, that's no, yeah. uh, a great point. Oh, sorry, Rodrigo, go ahead. No, I was going to say I, I agree with Suzanne. There is, and I think I've shared with you and, and, and Shane, uh, there is a, 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 a cultural paradigm, paradigm in, in corporate, uh, at least in, in corporations, right? Like the ones. Uh, we all belong to uh, when it comes to transparency. Uh, that is very true, right? And that, that is key. Uh, we all talk about uh, sharing information and being transparent, but when it comes down to the culture of transparency, when you look at it in depth, a lot of us feel uh, threatened, right? A lot of us are like, well, you know, we, I operate a lot in the, in the food side because of, of my business. And uh, when you look at food production from the feed stuff to the animal uh, to the meat in the in the in the case there is a lot of concerns on, of how that information is going to be used so definitely there is a cultural shift that needs to happen in the corporate world and, and that is uh, we need to figure out the way yeah no i mean i definitely agree uh and, and you know thinking about these cultural changes that have to come along with uh some of the technological changes and in a lot of ways i think the technology is out in front um but to get the the, the culture there is going to be a challenge um boy i wish we had more time there's so many great questions that were coming through thank you to the audience too for posting up some of these um as well i don't think we have time to respond to too many more but i did want to take the last two or three minutes here just uh for the panelists to hey thank you uh, very much for for uh for chiming in sharing some of your points of views but be asked if there's any sort of closing thoughts or, or, or comments that you might have as we uh wrap up the uh, pharma session here Maybe I'll start with just uh, encouraging uh, companies and enterprises to um, investigate uh, real uh, blockchain-based solutions. Again, there's a lot of learning, setting up nodes, thinking through the privacy concerns. I think there's a lot of things that in, um, in a small pilots, you definitely identify, but when the rubber hits the road, it gets real. And I do think the future is so exciting and so bright. Um, my appreciation to ENY for all the great um, use cases they're highlighting. Um, but my hope is that um, enterprises, especially maybe in this critical time, um, really think about um, maybe getting more bold uh, in their innovation choices uh, to try and adopt uh, some of this great technology so the future can actually come sooner. Very cool. I think uh, going off of what Suzanne said, I think it should be really important for large companies to start thinking about their security and risk protocols. Um, so a lot of the times we explore, you know, whether or not we want to participate in a public versus private blockchain and what the implications of that are, um, what the different use cases we can start exploring right now are. Um, but I think it'll be really, really important in the future to really start to think about um, what, you know, what the protocols for security and risk uh, that are in place right now and how those have to change and how you have to think about those when you start thinking about implementing uh, blockchain solutions, both uh, public and private. That's very good guidance there, right? I can speak from personal experience about uh, what happens when you don't address some of those concerns up front and you start building right away, right? Um, yeah, it's, it's some good counsel. Uh, and finally, Rotary, any, any last thoughts or comments? Thank you. Yes, uh, echoing what Suzanne and, and, and Megan said, 
I think in the consumer marketplace, which where a lot of us uh, participate directly or indirectly, um, transparency is going to become a license to operate. It's not going to be a matter of market share or better price uh, is, or accessing a specific market is going to become a matter of license to operate. We're all, we all going to have to either offer transparency or support uh, the mm. industries to offer transparency. And, um, and I think blockchain provides a great platform to offer, to offer that transparency. And so I'd, I just encourage people to, to think about it that way. You think on a, on a, in a world where we all have to be very transparent or you know, if we are today 10% transparent, live in a world that we are 80% transparent. Mm -hmm. And what's the best tool uh, that we will have to, to share all that information. And I think a lot of us or a lot of people would, would find a good, good try in, in blockchain. Those are some really great, um, real great closing comments and a lot of things to really think through, right? And it's definitely culture change that's coming along with the technology. Um, thank you again for, for sharing some of your points of view. Uh, I found this to be really insightful. Um, and again, thank you for the audience for, for some of the great questions that were coming in.